Hey, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech on a, on a given Thursday morning uh, here on uh, Talking Tax with Tom. That's Tom Yamachika, the handsome guy in, on the screen. Uh, and Sylvia Luke, she, uh, she gives us the honor of joining us this morning. Uh, she is a state representative since 1922. Am I right, Sylvia? Uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the chair of House Finance, which is very important, and she's been doing that for a long time. Uh, so uh, I'm so happy we could talk about the uh, the 2020 session, such as it is. I call it the on again, off again session. Maybe we call it the Swiss cheese session. Um, but let's talk first about um, you know your your side job this session, which was the COVID. Uh, the special select COVID committee. Uh, can you talk about it? You have some slides. Can you can you tell us what's uh, what what happened? Right. So um, the uh, as you mentioned, this was a session that was really um, uh, lengthened due to COVID. And what had happened is, as soon as the Capitol and session was initially locked down in the middle of March, um, the House. Um, created a COVID committee to deal with a variety of items, including health and safety, including um, business needs, including the needs of um, the various residents. And thanks to uh, the leadership of Speaker Scott Psyche, the committee has done tremendous amount of work. And the committee was instrumental in assisting the governor to come out with the um, reopening plan as well. Um, so if we could just... Um, uh, I don't know if this is the time to talk about some of the things that um, was presented to the committee um, right now, or you want to talk about it later? No, sure. So why, don't you, why don't you tell us? Slide. So one of the things um, and that the committee did was, uh, you know, they had uh, business folks, they had Carl Bonham, um, you know, they had um, various sectors, nonprofits come together and talk about various things. And one of the things that um, we presented to the committee was what the CARES um, money was supposed to be used for. So uh, if we can just point to the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the guidelines say that um, Congress acted around April and uh, it provided tremendous amount of funds to uh, the various states. The state, in addition to the 1.25 billion that it received, it received, um, you know, close to 13 billion dollars in other uh, ways, um, direct subsidies to um, taxpayers and businesses, hospitals, and um, uh, other needs. Um, the committee, um, the COVID committee, is tracking all these things because one of the things that we want to make sure is we want to make sure that we use up all these funds. And there's timetable um, attached to these, um, the use of the funds. So, for instance, the 1.25 billion has to be used by the end of the year. Um, you know, a lot of times we think, okay, you know, how is it easy it is to just spend money? It's not as easy as people think because um, in um, in uh, allocating the funds, um, the executive branch and the various departments need to uh, figure out, okay, how do we get the $500 rent subsidies out to the people? Or how do we make sure that, you know, people have the SNAP benefits? So it's it's been very difficult and challenging in order to spend the 1.25. The good thing is we're relying a lot on the counties. Um, the counties um, have received about 45% of the 1.25 billion. Um, so the counties are working directly on the needs of their various islands as well. Okay. Well, wow. You've had your hands full. I know that even though the legislature has come and gone, uh, there have been a lot of committee meetings and a lot of discussion, a lot of outreach, if you will. Um, we, we get to, I get an email from Sharon Moriwaki every 20 minutes. Uh, she's telling me, telling me what's going on. <laughs> I'm sure she's not the only one. Uh, so look at, <laughs> Looking from a fiscal policy, Tom, what, what have we got going here with all this? I mean, this has a, a tremendous dramatic effect on a regular budgeting cycle. No? Oh, that, that's right. I mean, one of the things uh, that we're, we're following very closely, and I'm, I'm sure Sylvie is too, is uh, how, how we're going to spend that, um, that $1.25 billion. As, as she mentioned, a lot of it went to the counties, but a lot of it is being kept by the state uh, to, uh, to spend. Uh, on, on various things, um, one of which is that there is a uh, uh, a supplemental unemployment benefit uh, that that the states 
going to provide once the six hundred dollars a week that the feds are now providing uh, goes poof at the end of this month, which is in a couple of days. Uh, so, so the state uh, doesn't have the means to you know put in the six hundred, but they can, but they can and did put in one hundred, uh, and so that's going to kick in uh, on the, I think the first of August. Uh, there are uh, there is talk of continuing the federal benefits, but I don't think the uh, uh, the good folks in Washington are going to get their act together in time. Uh, so uh, we'll, they'll have to rely on the state benefits for a while. Right. That's, and that is, a, right. So um, as Tom pointed out, that is a major concern. Um, the unemployment plus stuff, which is the $600 runs out this week, and it will be a, um, you know, a huge impact on many of the uh, unemployed um, population um, um, uh, whose paycheck will go from 1200 to 600 or if somebody was getting about 1000 they're going to go from 1000 to 400 that's a huge um, impact on um, individuals who need this money to make ends meet um, the unfortunate thing is that the governor has just alerted us that uh, he will line item veto the $100 um, state plus up um, because he would like to wait to see what congress does but as Tom um, pointed out that, uh, you know, right now the Republican in the Senate and the Democrats in the House are still battling to figure out what to do uh, for the needs of the community. And, um, you know, it's going to be a while before they come to an agreement. Um, at the same time, you know, tons of um, millions and millions of American citizens are, uh, will continue to suffer unless Congress um, get together and come out with a, another relief package. Yeah, and then, and then line iteming the, uh, uh, the, the $100 plus up really makes no sense, I think, because there's uh, an automatic uh, provision that, that knocks it out if, if Congress comes through with $300 or more. So what's the, what's the sense in that? Yes, that's something that you need to ask the fit for. <laughs> Well, they, they are batting heads today, or at least the Republicans are batting heads. They can't get it together. But uh, I, I saw something j just on the fly this morning to the effect that they had reached some sort of agreement today. They're under enormous pressure nationally, uh, right. the Republicans, to do something right now immediately. Because if, if it goes off a cliff, it's going to be terrible. And so, they need to do something right away. Yeah. Yeah. An so, another thing that came up during the um, uh, uh, the, the CARES Act disbursement is this housing relief and resiliency program that HHFDC is supposed to administer. Uh, and the, the, the relief amount is supposed to be half of rent up to $500 a month. And uh, supposedly uh, people who are paying this, you know, this rent can go to HHFDC. Uh, how, how's that supposed to work? Yes. Um, so that was a significant part that was, that came out through the discussion of the House COVID committee, um, because housing was a big component. And uh, in as much as the various counties have tried to do a, a lot of rent subsidy, um, rent is by far the number one um, cost driver for a lot of the residents, especially with the high cost of living and the high cost of um, rent in Hawaii. So we recognize that a big portion of uh, the state's portion of the CARES funding had to go to rent subsidy. So the um, the thousand or hundred million dollars in rent subsidy, um, as you recognize, um, you know, the cap is five hundred dollars or half of the rent uh, will go to individuals. Uh, HHFDC um, itself will not be uh, administering. It is already reached out to various nonprofits to help administer because. Many times, a lot of the rent subsidies programs go through nonprofits because um, it, it will help us um, allocate the funds quickly as opposed to going through one department. So they are already talking to many of the nonprofits and they should be ready to go. Yeah, but then they can't do anything until the bill is signed, right? Right, right. So that's, that's actually the holdup. Um, so, you know, a lot of the programs that we put in the CARES um, funding bill, uh, including the $100 plus stuff for individual uh, for UI, uh, the $100 million for rent subsidy, um, the $100 million actually for PPE, which is really important for nonprofits, for schools, for healthcare. Um, you know, we put in a, a 
a large amount of relief. Uh, we're still waiting for the governor to act on these bills. And the unfortunate thing is, unless he sign it quickly, um, the departments don't really know whether, um, you know, they're taking the steps to um, implement, but they can't do the complete go ahead until he gives the go ahead. Right now, and that program you just mentioned was uh, supposed to be administered through Hi uh, Emma. Hi Emma. Uh, yeah, the Emergency Management Association. Um, right. uh, how's it going to work? I mean, did they, did they tell you how it's going to work? Right. So I have I just, no idea. Uh, right. So what they have already been doing is they have been purchasing many of the uh, disinfected products and um, um, PPE, personal protective equipment, and they have a um, lot of the products um, ready to go. Uh, what they will be doing is bulk buying um, uh, the product and then distributing it to um, businesses, small businesses, either through the chamber or different type of nonprofit. Um, we'll also be distributing it to the nonprofit. So um, the Haima's work is not the actual distribution. Um, it, its job is to bulk purchase a lot of the materials and then they will use they will, they're already in contact with a major um, organization and um, nonprofits and then ready to go. But again, as you recognize, Tom, the governor needs to sign the bill. Okay, yeah, so the idea is to have Hayama be a Costco, for example, <laughs> they just buy everything in bulk and, and then just yeah. get it out. Yeah. Okay. Buy it in bulk and then give it out because, you know, I think um, the last thing we want is, you know, while um, small businesses and nonprofits and um, even child care facilities are suffering and, um, you know, they, they can, um, they have uh, other limitation on the number of patrons that go to their facility. The last thing you want is for them to also worry about um, PPE and disinfectant. So we want to make sure that when they're ready to open, uh, especially childcare and long-term care facilities, we want to make sure that the state provides those needs. Great. What are, what are the other, um, you know, big uh, or significant uh, expenditures in, in this uh, CARES Act money? Uh, right. Senate Bill 126. Right. So one of the things that um, has been missing is um, some type of an economic driver and uh, as opposed to buying a lot of the disinfected products or PPE from the mainland or, or overseas, we, uh, we will be in this situation for a while. So we need to make sure that we grow our own and make sure that we create an industry that provides dis disinfected products and um, PPE. So we have set aside, uh, I believe, I think $30 million. Uh, 15 for the 15. supply chain grants. Right, so $15 million in grants. Um, if there are businesses, uh, you know, um, willing to um, make PPE and make um, disinfected products for our local community. And then, you know, this is an opportunity. It's twofold, right? So we're taking care of the needs of the community by providing these needs. Uh, but at the same time, we're making sure that, you know, we try to, um, uh, you know, uh, put in some economic activity because a lot of the economic activity is uh, missing or reducing it at a substantial rate. Um, so the way this is going to work is um, DBED has already looked at um, uh, how to implement. And because DBED through HTDC has been pretty successful in allocating HTDC um, innovation grant funding and high tech funding, um, um, they're very familiar how to do this. And, you know, when you look at local breweries, they quickly um, went into the, um, the hand sanitizer and disinfectant um, work. So, you know, this is an opportunity for us to help those local businesses as well. Yeah, as long as you can do something about the, uh, uh, the liquor commission saying, you know, you, you can't do this. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> A million, then, uh, balls okay, then, air, a million balls in the air, Cynthia. You know, this is a, a universe, a constellation of things that the legislature has never been faced with before, never, ever. And right. so yeah. the question yeah. I put to you with all of this, you know, with all of this happening, how do you manage to, to ba balance the budget? And um, yeah, wanna, you know, tell me about the budget. You started out with a $2 billion shortfall. How did you, how did you deal with that? Right. 
So this has been a very, very challenging um, to say that it, this is a this was a challenging session is um, uh, doesn't even explain the type of um, uh, needs and the stress that uh, you know the community and the legislature had to go through and um, we rely a lot on people like Tom to help us sort through some of the tax bills but um, just to balance um, the needs of the community plus balance the budget plus um, looking at the revenue shortfall and what is the impact for the future it, it, it is it has been tremendously difficult. Uh, so what we're looking at is, as you know, the Council on Revenues did a projection uh, of what the um, revenue loss was going to be for this year. They projected a negative seven loss, negative seven, one point um, J is equivalent to about 65 million. So if you think about that 65 times seven, that's about 500 million, right? Um, a little over 500 million. So that's automatically a 500 million loss for fiscal year 20, which is um, ending June um, uh, 2020. We just got the actual um, revenue picture for from the tax department, what the revenue loss for 2020 was, and that came out to negative 6.2. So the Council on Revenues was very close. Um, um, because negative seven versus negative 6.2, you know, I mean, that's relatively speaking, it's not a big difference. Um, but yeah. the concern is for next year, the, the Council on Revenues projected a negative 12 loss, negative 12, if you times that by um, six, um, 65, I mean, you know, that's, what is that? That's like um, 780. Yeah. 700 to 800 million dollar loss. I think it's the, yeah. And um, so, uh, so the question is, okay, how do we balance the budget? The good thing is after I became finance chair um, about eight years ago, we have put in a substantial amount into rainy day fund. And that's because we did not want to do what happened in 2009. You know, in 2009, we had to do furloughs. We had to, um, and we had to uh, shut down um, schools. We had to shut down essential government service. And that actually exacerbated the economic um, rebound. So in 2009, we looked at, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, over a billion dollar loss. And so one of the things I made a commitment was we will make sure that we put a substantial amount into rainy day fund. When I first became finance chair, we barely had about $30 million. Um, as of this year, we have close to $400 million. $400 million go a long way in helping to balance the budget. The other thing is we put in, um, we made a commitment to uh, reduce the unfunded liability so that that in itself is about, you know, um, in addition to what we have to pay in, um, with all of these unfunded liability needs, we pay about $400 million more on top of that. Uh, at least for the time being, that's not something that we need to pay right away because it's not a specific thing. So we made huge investments that we can try to um, um, swap out in the meantime. The other thing is vacancies. Um, I've been very critical and Tom has too um, on a lot of the vacancies that um, that are existing in state government and um, some of the departments use the vacancy amounts for other expenses or other needs. Um, you know, I've been very critical of that. So when we reduce all the vacancies, that came out to about hundred million dollars. So if can you imagine hundred million dollars of monies in state government that um, should have been filled by position and it has it. Um, hasn't. So we reduce all the vacancy. That was another $100 million. The other thing is um, we made cash investments into um, things like rental housing trust fund and a law stadium, which we were able to quickly swap out with bond funds. So that was a reduction in the programs, but we were able to just swap out, um, borrow funds with real cash. So immediately we were able to look at about $800 million worth of cash that we could allocate to balance the budget. $800 million is a huge amount because as you can see, that's um, you know close to 13%, um, right? Because if you're looking at 65, um, 
uh, $65 million as one point. So uh, I think we were able to, because of some of the, um, some of the smart money choices that we made in the past, we were able to be in a position where we're not looking at shutting down schools, um, you know, shutting down services, shutting down ambulance service or um, other type of hospital services. So we are very thankful for, um, for the foresight that the legislature um, has had in making sure that, you know, some of these things are done. And um, Tom and my special, um, Pet P, which is a special fund, we haven't even got into uh, looking at reducing special funds, and that's been so. That's been um, a pet project for Tom and I for years now. And um, you know, about forty years ago, we started out with just a dozen special funds, and now we have hundred thousand, close to thousand special funds in all types of departments. And um, this is not very um, budget transparent, and we've been very critical of that as well. So we have not even started tackling um, and reducing some of the special funds where we can reallocate some of those special funded needs for two general funds. How much well, is in, in the special funds? The, uh, if, if have I you got an idea, Sylvia, of how much money is, is in those funds? Well, um, we are doing an analysis. It depends because some of the special funds we won't be able to um, uh, convert to general funds. So, for instance, highway funds. Highway funds are especially um, there uh, for the needs of highway repair and improvement. Um, so, it really depends. So, we are doing an analysis of every special fund. Mm -hmm. Tom? And, yeah, and uh, uh, in the on the along the lines of balancing the budget, uh, I know there was a a big controversy earlier in the year where the governor said, well, okay, we're going to be uh, reducing everybody's pay by 20%, 10% of your first responder. Uh, and then in the midst of that, the legislature passes a, uh, a, a bill that funds the collective bargaining increases. Uh, what kind of dynamic has gone on there and, and where, where, where do we stand with that, Sylvia? Right. So, you know, as far as the uh, pay raises, um, I understand there were a lot of concerns around the pay raises, but uh, when we looked at um, when we looked at all the collective bargaining units, um, and then when we look at the HGA units versus UPW versus um, UPA and HSTA, um, the reality was that HSTA and um, UPW already got their um, raises. So for instance, those raises are already calculated into the budget, whereas HGA, because they were um, late in submitting the request, um, they didn't get their raises. So um, the intent was, okay, if we are gonna do a across the board um, pay cut or furloughs, uh, which the governor is talking about, then you have to equalize everybody and get them at the point where they all start. Otherwise, you know, if you're an HGA member and you get hit with a furlough, it's furlough plus a pay cut um, because they never realized those raises unlike the UPW and HSTA workers. So it was, it was really about fairness. Um, so going back to uh, furloughs and pay cuts, I mean, the governor has um, talked about those things. He has um, yet to have a uh, discussion with the unions and we're still waiting for updates on uh, what his plan is in balancing the budget. Um, uh, I think they're struggling with uh, a lot of things um, because, you know, I mean, as you recognize, Jay, this is not something that, um, you know, we've ever faced and this is not going away. Our budget um, problems will continue for the next, at least I think the next two years. Um, so, uh, this year, I think we were able to uh, finish the legislature um, balancing the budget, take care of the needs of the community. When we come back um, just six months um, or five months from now, um, we will have a huge job ahead of us at that time. Yeah, I see the worst case analysis is pretty bad on that. I mean, first of all, you have dramatic increase in the number of uh, cases, coronavirus cases. Um, and uh, Congress is a little bit locked up, and uh, we we are we hope we need more money from them. We may not get as much as we need. Um, the economy is uh, is in the tank, and it's that's going to increase in a in a significant way, as far as I can see. 
Um, and next year, businesses are, in fact, you know, every day in Pacific Business News, you see that this is closing and that's closing and they're closing permanently. They're not coming back. Substantial businesses. Um, so by the time we get into 2021, it's going to be worse. Uh, and it's going to be tougher on the legislature because your tax receipts are going to be less. So where does, where does that go? I mean, what's your feeling about that? I mean, yeah, your, your house finance, Sylvia, you got to be thinking about uh, the worst case analysis going on in 2021. Right. So I am very worried about um, 2021. Um, uh, you know, vaccine is not going to come out for at least another six months. And um, I would think, um, you know, the first round of vaccines will go to, um, you know, first responders and people who really need um, um, uh, to have vaccine right away. Uh, it, it is going to be very difficult. And, um, you know, I think um, next year when we see 12% um, decrease in revenues, it is going to be a huge impact on services. So we just got to do our due diligence and make sure that we can balance and provide services at the same time. Uh, well, do you I think businesses so. are prepared for uh, the, uh, I mean, there's, there's going to be some automatic tax increases that hit at the end of the year. For, uh, and I'm think, specifically thinking about uh, unemployment insurance tax. Um, how, how, how do you, what advice would you have for businesses to see if they can cope with that? So um, that's why one of the things that we did in the CARES funding is that any remnants that we, uh, we do not use, we put it into the underlying um, state UI so that the impact on businesses will not be um, uh, substantial. What about the uh, conforming bill with the, with the federal changes? Have we talked about that? Yeah, we, we only have a minute left. So um, I was just kind of noticing that the uh, we, we conform to some things uh, in the federal income tax changes. Uh, uh, some of the things that we left on the table were um, adjustments to net operating losses and the, the ability to monetize them. That was kind of deemed important at the federal level, but uh, we didn't adopt them here. Uh, the the tax department's testimony really gave no reasons for that, but I, but I think it's just, uh, you know, we, we can't afford it. Is that, is that how it played out? Exactly. And so the tax conformity bill uh, was, um, you know, the, de the decision whether to conform or not conform, unfortunately, was very run by revenue picture as opposed to um, ease of taxpayers. So that was kind of the unfortunate thing. Um, um, I'm thinking, you know, that will be the reality for the near future as well. And the, the TAT, last time I heard the TAT that the state was collecting was not going to the counties. Is that still the case? Yes. Um, apparently, the governor has um, um, postponed or, um, you know, put a stop on any kind of TAT allocation. So I think that's um, no TAT to the counties and HT mm -hmm. at the same time. You know, Sylvia, I just wanted to mention uh, uh, that uh, I voted for you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but you're 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 unopposed. It was a very easy choice. <laughs> At least you didn't vote for blank. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a whole thing going on now with uh, with with PACs and PAC funding uh, from outside the state on state races for reasons that are not clear and by donors who are not clear. Um, and there was an article in Civil Beat a couple of days ago about huge amounts of money that, that are coming, for example, to mayoral races and to city council races. And, I, and I'm sure that's, that's going to be or is the case for the state legislature. I wonder if you could comment on that. All right. I, you know, anytime um, um, outside forces um, get involved in races, I, I don't think it's um, a transparent way. I think um, candidates should be able to raise their own money and should use their own money to either be um, in favor or in opposition or, you know, state your position. And it's always not right when PACs get involved. Um, I do not agree with that approach. And I had an aggressive bill introduced, uh, which would um, penalize um, PAC and independent expenditure activity. Um, clearly, that has some constitutional issues, but I think it's worth looking at because we will continue to have um, uh, influences, um, not just nationally, locally as well, that uh, guys under the PAC 
to influence um, races. And I don't think that's something that Hawaii uh, voters um, will continue to tolerate. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully next year we can get into that. So Tom, have you got any last questions or maybe uh, some broader thoughts about this session and, and uh, how we did and um, you know how we will do? Well, I, uh, it was, like I said, a very abbreviated session. Uh, you know, only the uh, the most essential things were considered. I think we put out like uh, eighty bills as opposed to the usual two hundred and fifty. You know, sent up to the sent up to the fifth floor. Uh, so, uh, on on the on the tax side, uh, only two bills uh, passed and, and went upstairs, as opposed to the usual you know uh, four or five pages worth. Uh, so there's, there's been, I, I think, a lot of uh, deferred activity, and we're going to see, I think, a lot next year. And what have happened to vaping? That got deferred, and it's going to be considered next year, too. I I'm, I'm happy that it got deferred. It's, <laughs> it's simply not a priority. <laughs> well, thank you, Sylvia. It's great to have you here, and it's great to be able to talk to you about these things. I hope we can circle back and uh, do it again. Very valuable for the public, very valuable for our viewers. Yeah, so, no, thank you for doing this. This is very informative um, for your viewers. And so I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, guys. Be safe. Thank you, Tom. Aloha, you guys. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.